We just heard about the top 500 and we saw that we see sort of a leveling off of a performance increase over the last probably two or three years and maybe for the number 500 for the last maybe four years or something like that. What do you see as the main reason? What do you think is behind that? So th there is a, c a couple of possibilities what it could be. Uh, the first thing we looked at is, is it something in the basic technologies and the chip technologies? And to best of our ability, there is no sign that it's actually rooted in that. Could still be something in, s in system technology, uh, but it's much more likely that it's something different. And the two main candidates, in my opinion, are it could be a price factor that the pricing model f uh, of switching from one generation to another has uh, has changed, so we have less money to do it, we might have less budget to do it, even though I, I somewhat doubt that that is the case. Uh, the, the, third, um, the third possibility is also a little harder for us to track, but should eventually show up in our data is that we are actually losing customer segments in the top 500, that some of the commercial customers are actually switching to cloud-based systems, which we don't capture in, in our data collection, and that because of that uh, loss of customers we see a decline in performance which uh, is actually not there, which it which it just becomes dark to us. We don't capture the data anymore in our data collection. Okay. Jack? Yeah, I, I think I agree with uh, Eric in, in these points. Um, uh, right now, um, we're, at a, we're at a point where um, these machines, of course, are very expensive. The existing machines are serving a purpose. Uh, the applications have not grown perhaps as fast and the demand is not there really to meet that next, that next stage. Eric uh, pointed out that uh, perhaps some users are falling off from demanding more and more computing power. Think of a pyramid in some sense and we have this pyramid and we got short, a, a smaller number of people really at the top end of that pyramid demanding those cycles. The demand will always be there so I'm sure that the demand for high performance computing will exist but uh, right now we don't see quite as, as much of it. Uh, funding is, a, is an issue so the economy perhaps having some effect on this at the top end. You know we're really building up towards exascale in the US we think of uh, the next machines that come out are the machines before exascale so when that machine comes out the next crank turn will push us uh, towards exascale and that number has been pushed out to uh, 2022 or 2023 mainly for um, financial reasons uh, money being put into the system so I think a number of things compound the situation so that we have the stable stable situation today but I think it will it will enhance and move forward in the in the near future Okay. So in general, what would you expect over the coming maybe two or three years? It's always difficult to predict the future, but from, from the data that you have and when you look at the market, what would you expect to happen in the next maybe two or three years? Well, one, one thing which has changed compared to 10, 20 years ago is that now technological changes are much more step functions there, which are much more clearly defined. Uh, so whenever we get uh, we really introduce a new te uh, a new level of chip technology or chip design chip architecture that's going to make a bigger impact and purchase delays at the very high end of delayed and timed so at the at the very high end i would expect to see more and more of a step function and more and more of the customers being in sync so hopefully we would have a year where we would have a lot of turnover in the top 10 or in the top 500 in general, but then we might have two years where we have a much, a much uh, turnover at a much lower level. So it becomes more and more of a step function. People have told me that they no longer purchase mid-term mid, mid -term upgrades because it's very, very hard to integrate those and because you have to build out certain features like the networks from the get-go at the high levels and stuff like that. So in that sense, market behavior is definitely changing. And as we are getting closer to the end of the decade and as we are approaching on the chip level more and more at the end of Moore's law, I think architecture and how our ability to use the architecture at hand is really going to become more and more important. So I actually expect to see a bigger variety in terms of architectures, um, at, which is going to come with higher cost per architectures and per development. But architecture and details of architecture is going to be more a differentiating factor. Now, being a benchmark or performance um, person, I must say, that will ultimately, of course, trigger even more discussions about what is the right benchmark than we have uh, so far. 
Right. So uh, just to just to look ahead uh, for uh, that period of time, we know in the states uh, there are three machines that are going to be deployed at the Department of Energy sites, and uh, the Department of Energy is committing uh, close to six hundred million dollars for hardware to deploy those systems, and those systems will uh, bring us in the mid. It'll be beyond the hundred petaflop uh, range. Um, so those are going to be accelerated based systems. Uh, so we know that that technology is going to be there. We know that uh, China was planning to put in place a hundred petaflop system by the end of this year, but because of the um, embargo imposed by the Department of Commerce in the U.S., uh, U.S. parts cannot be part of that scheme, so that's going to delay the Chinese efforts. Probably a year is, is what I've heard. It'll delay in, in terms of deploying uh, 100 petaflop systems within, within China. And, uh, you know, we understand that uh, Japan has a plan for post uh, uh, post uh, uh, petaflop systems, uh, uh, and so so there is movement, there is there is drive. Systems will will evolve, and we'll we'll see uh, new systems in place. So roughly in the twenty in the three year window that we're talking about. You announced something like HPC uh, GM GMG, and you have something running which is called HPC GG. So who is going to win? <laughs> Well, if if we'll if if, if, at, if at least one of us succeeds, the community is going to win, right? Oh, that's that's the way to look at it. Exactly. It's a friendly yes, friendly competition. Absolutely. We yeah, we let me steer the discussion a little bit sorry. further. <laughs> given, given, given that we say that some of the applications probably don't need that high level of performance anymore, and given that these application fields are the traditional ones, yeah, we we're talking about fluid dynamics. We're talking about crash simulation. It's something which we will hear about from from our keynote speaker today. Um, are we actually uh, looking at the right benchmark still? Because these are very traditional methods, in a sense. Mesh-based methods, finite element, finite volume, typically that's what you have. Should, should we look at something uh, that is closer to, say, bioinformatics or something like that, where we have completely different schemes, completely different measures? So, yes and no. Uh, there is there is always have been examples of industries which saturated their needs for computing and, and have drifted off to the lower end. ISVs are actually very strong in that market. They have never been at the very high end. However, at the same time, if you look at combustion, including chemistry and turbulence and stuff like that, it's very clear that even exascale computers are not going to satisfy those needs. So there are traditional science areas where computing power and the need for computing power will, will remain. The question is how do we capture new applications like bioinformatics and those things. And there are of course efforts like the Graph 500 uh, trying to do very different benchmarks, non-floating point benchmarks, uh, trying to come up uh, with other measures. Uh, th that's uh, very important. Uh, it's also very difficult as the example of the Gra Graph 500 shows. Um, switching to something very throughput based, I would actually argue against that. I think it's very important to focus on an integrated large-scale application type benchmark and not drift off, off trying to capture what goes on in clouds and stuff like that. That's a different business model, that's a different market segment and if somebody wants to do that, fine, but the core of the top 500 was always the high-end scientific computing. Yeah, I agree with what Eric just said. You know, the, uh, it's always elusive to benchmark a system, and we all understand that you can't rely on one number to predict how, how things are going to work. So the best benchmark would be the benchmark that you come up with, the user of that system, in trying to understand what your applications will, will perform on, on your machine. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, we, we want to give some range, let's say, in terms of performance. Where today, Linpack is, uh, is exaggerating the performance that you would, you would see. We want to give something much more realistic. And both uh, HPCG and HPGMG give a much more realistic picture of how performance is for a, for a class of applications that seem to run on uh, the big machines today, or at least the ones that uh, do scientific computations. Good. Gentlemen, it was a pleasure talking to you. I would love to continue this, but we have to stop here. This was Michael Resch from the show floor of IAC 2015 on the first day with Eri Stromer from NERSC and Jack Dungara from the University of Tennessee. Thank you.